Coming up on DTNS, Intel picks Ohio for its new U.S. chip fabs, a polarizing phone camera lens that can detect skin cancer and black ice, and, I don't know, people, maybe Netflix's future is gaming. I give up. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 21st, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Also in Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. And from somewhere around the location of Los Angeles, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, there is a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet. Lots of food topics uh, in today's episode. You can get that wider version of the show, patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons, including Brandon Brooks, Alexander Neshev, and Robert Hillman. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Executive moves continue under new Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal, Chief Information Security Officer, a.k.a. CISO Rinky Sethi, and Head of Security Peter Mudge Zotko are out. Zotko has already left, and Sethi is set to leave in a few weeks. New York Times reports they are leaving because of an assessment of how the organization was being led and the impact on top priority work. Previous Twitter departures included Dantley Davis, former head of design, and Michael Montano, the former head of engineering. Windows Central obtained a mid-2018 pre-release build of Microsoft's Andromeda OS running on a Lumia 950, a council version of Windows Intended uh, for the Surface Duo. Now, the OS emphasizes a journaling inking experience, letting users take notes directly on a lock screen, with the journal app always running in the background for quick access. Animations and a multitasking UI from Andromeda were ported over to the version of Android that shipped on the Duo. Oh, so it wasn't a total abandoned piece of software. Yeah. Forest River Farms in Forest River, North Dakota, has filed a federal antitrust class action lawsuit earlier this month claiming John Deere made excess profits by preventing farmers and small shops from accessing diagnostic software for repairs. Specifically, the suit alleges that John Deere monopolized the repair services market for John Deere agricultural equipment with engine control units, or ECUs. The case has been assigned to Judge Martha M. Packold in the U.S. District Court for the District of Northern Illinois. A detailed analysis of the case, really well done, uh, detailed analysis of the case is available on agweek.com. You may have seen headlines saying Peloton has halted all production of its bikes and treadmills as demand grinds to a halt. You may have also seen headlines about the negative effect these stories have had on Peloton stock. Now, ahead of upcoming earnings, Peloton CEO John Foley released a statement under the heading, rumors that we are halting all production of bikes and treads are false. The statement went on to say that with pandemic-driven demand waning, it will right-size its production. So it did not deny reports of layoffs, but Foley said that the company is considering all options. Okay, so bad, just not quite as bad. Is what yeah, I'm getting from that. Right size. The Bahamas, Nigeria, Cambodia all have official central bank digital currencies. Of course, China is far down the road of its testing of them, but the U.S. is still in the investigative stage. Thursday, the U.S. Federal Reserve issued a review of the idea of a U.S. issued central bank digital currency. The report seeks public feedback and includes 22 questions, which the Fed would like the public to submit answers for. So if you got thoughts on this, now's your chance. Let the Fed know what you think. The report also notes that any U.S. CBDC would need to be faster and cheaper to use, protect privacy, and not replace the existing financial system. In fact, the report clarified that any CBDC would be issued through existing financial institutions, not direct to consumers. The Fed also noted it would not proceed without a specific authorizing law to do so. All right, let's talk a little more about this big Intel announcement. Intel's bid to catch up to Samsung and TSMC took its next step on Friday. Intel has selected a thousand acre site in New Albany, Ohio, just outside of Columbus, as its third U.S. chip-making location. Operations there are expected to start in 2025, so they're going to start breaking ground soon and finish up in four years. CEO Pat Gelsinger told Time he expects it to become the largest silicon manufacturing location on the planet. Intel is committed to build at least two chip fabs there, uh, but they could build as many as eight. But why in Ohio? Time reports that it costs approximately 30% more to build a plant in the United States versus Taiwan, South Korea, or Singapore. Forget China. Even those non-Chinese mainland places uh, are cheaper. That's data according to the Semiconductor Industry Association. 
Building factories in the U.S., however, helps politicians. So politicians will help you with maybe some tax breaks and stuff. It also theoretically could ease supply chain problems, though keep in mind in practice, most chips will be sent overseas anyway. Uh, you may make the chip in Ohio, but you're going to send it to Taiwan or Singapore or South Korea for assembly, for testing, for packaging, and and not even just one of those places for uh, those. It's true that uh, a chip, passes maybe a dozen borders in the course of making a product. So wow. uh, that's always true, no matter where the original chip is made. To help this make financial sense, the U.S. House is considering the CHIPS Act. Uh, they are so good with uh, anagrams on, on the Hill. Uh, that has passed the U.S. Senate back in June. Uh, it would deliver $52 billion in subsidies to chip makers. They're trying to get enough votes for it in the House. Gelsinger has indicated that if the CHIPS Act is passed— it might build more assembly, packaging, and testing sites in the United States, bringing more of that supply chain in. Uh, you could uh, see that making sense. Much of the sand that is used to make semiconductors worldwide comes from the U.S. South. Uh, Gelsinger told Time, quote, My objective would be sand to product to services all on American soil. Well, he's a third of the way there already because the sand is here. Uh, Intel already has U.S. operations in Oregon and Arizona, uh, so Ohio will be the third location. TSMC is building one in Arizona as well. Samsung is expanding its operations in Texas. And uh, Europeans don't feel left out. Intel plans to build a $100 billion complex in Europe as well. Intel's Kevin S. Farjani said that decision will come in the next three or four months. So, Lamar, the the yeah. the I I wonder how this goes down because to me I'm not sure that it makes sense to try to replicate the entire supply chain in every location, right? There are advantages to a global supply chain where chips pass borders twelve times because people are better at it in one part of the world than another, and 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 yes, the pandemic messed it up for a while, but eventually we will have uh, good global shipping lanes open. So, what do you think of this? Yeah, when you mentioned uh, Ohio, I immediately thought of okay, the Midwest, manufacturing, mm -hmm. cars, Detroit, and, and and so you know, there's always been that promise to we're going to bring back jobs to you know the manufacturing jobs to the Midwest, so everybody can you know you can go in there to factory job, you know everybody can have a job, and, and I I get that, and I think also you mentioned uh, politically, it's it's great to be able to say that to people, say sure. hey we we're working on this for you. Um, but, and, and I also think there's this sentiment that we just need to be doing more of our own stuff here. Uh, uh, the article mentioned that, um, in 1990, we manufactured about 37% of our stuff mm -hmm. here. Now mm -hmm. it's down to 12%. Of, uh, of so, chips, right? Of, of chips. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah uh, of the chips. So, you know, it, it has gone down, but here's, I, I think I'm with you on part of this is, is that. If they're going to be passing through all these borders, which I didn't really think about, I didn't think that we can make all the stuff here and it still has to go somewhere else to do testing because it's cheaper to do or for them to do quality control. Uh, is it worth it? At what point do we just say, no, we're doing it all here? Can we can we absorb that cost? Uh, it's 30 percent right now. Maybe it's 40 if you bring it here. Maybe it's 50. But, you know, can't can we mm -hmm. absorb that? And if they're not willing to subsidize it are we okay as consumers with the prices going up? Yeah, this is, this is a complex topic and I, I don't I, I don't want to oversimplify it because I Absolutely. I think it's good that Intel on its own without a subsidy, I, they're getting some property tax breaks from Ohio, so there's some subsidization. But, but without the CHIPS Act, uh, Intel finds it worthwhile to build a plant in Ohio. And that is a reflection that it is not as cheap to go elsewhere as it used to be. Used to be uh, and yeah. there are other advantages, including the sand, <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to having things in Ohio. And the global supply chain di diversification is now important. And I, and I think that's that's worthwhile. I think they, companies risk overreacting. The sort of like, one person uh, may have had a bomb in their shoe once, so now everybody has to take their shoes off uh, kind of reaction. Right. But I, I don't think building these plants is bad. What I think people have to wrap their heads around is, I don't know that the subsidization and encouraging everything to try to be built in the U.S. will get you the result you want. It may still raise prices, uh, and it may not lead to efficiency. The, 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 the efficiencies are having the, the best and most efficient operations, no matter where they are in the world, make the stuff— and this is a lot more complex than just like, oh, well, if you build the chip here, now everything's here. It's it, it, it's a lot more complex than that. And I'm not sure you would ever get every part 
of the production chain in one country. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the, you know, end goal here or the solution is other than to just sound like, hey, we're bringing jobs back. And, you know, this this is a good thing uh, for, for everybody. It makes politicians happy. It makes people happy in the yeah. Midwest. Uh, but other than that, I'm yeah, I'm not I'm not. I will love things to be here, but I guess where my head's at right now is I'm all for supply chain diversification, build some plants in Ohio, build some plants in Europe. Let's, let's have them in more places. They were a little over localized being in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, Absolutely. Uh, but let's not try to like build little miniature self-contained supply chains, uh, in every region. I'm not sure that's, if that might be overdoing it, uh, that, that, that might, might not get you the efficiency you're looking for. I think so. Last year, MetaLens, uh, you spell that with a Z, by the way, MetaLens, developed a smartphone camera lens that uses nanostructure to bend light rays. That allows it to use a single lens to get the same functionality as a stack of lenses because the nanostructure can do the reflections and the focusing. Uh, and that means phone cameras that use MetaLens would take up less space. No bump on your phone. First product with a MetaLens lens is coming in Q2. But... They're already on to their new products as well. MetaLens announced another lens with nanostructure that can maintain something called polarization information in light. Polarization of a light wave changes not just based on where it came from, but the type of surface it bounced off of. Light that bounces off smooth surfaces oscillates differently than light that bounces off a rough surface, and that changes the polarization. Uh, if you've ever worn sunglasses, they probably had some kind of polarization that reduced glare and reflections. Polarization image sensors aren't new. They're used for detecting skin cancer already in labs, but you got to go into a lab to do it. Uh, Sony came out with a, a polarization image sensor a few years ago, a little bit inefficient, a little bit not exactly cost effective. And MetaLens believes its version is more efficient and it can work in a smartphone, uh, which expands the availability of it. That means more data would be captured by these lenses if they're in smartphones. And that means you'd have more data to train algorithms to detect things in the polarization that would be useful. An algorithm could be trained to use polarization information to verify that a facial recognition system is actually viewing a human face and not a flat picture of a human face. Other possibilities include more widespread skin cancer detection. Uh, so you could do some screening on your own phone instead of having to go into a lab. Assessing air quality, detecting black ice on the road. In fact, it may even help autonomous cars see through fog and rain better. MetaLens said devices with this polarization preserving lens could be available by 2023. Yeah, I, I find this pretty fascinating. I don't, I, this is not the type of uh, tech or science I'm very knowledgeable of, but, you know, when you mentioned the the, the availability of being able to screen your, yourself for skin, you know, skin cancer or, or some other type of things, that that's that's exciting. You know, a Apple's already, or, or in, in Google too, are already working on, you know, different things connecting your health to your to your yeah, phone yeah. and different things you can already do. So that, I, I, I find, to me personally, as I get older, being able to at least look at that. Now, it's not going to be like, 100% diagnostic. You, you need to go to the doctor to verify it. Yeah, but it's not going to replace it, the doctor. Yeah, yeah but, but it, 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 it could solve some. It could solve a lot of problems. I, I didn't. I didn't think of the whole like Tesla or other alternative autonomous cars being able to see better uh, with yeah. using using that different uh, lens. So sounds fascinating. I, I want to learn more about it because I, I don't know a lot. Yeah, I'm very curious that that first gen, uh, what phone it's going to end up. I, I was wondering if it might be in the Samsung Galaxy, but I doubt it because that's going to come out before Q2. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm curious where it'll pop up first and, and whether they'll be able to get the polarization one in there. I, I don't want it to be over promised, right? It's not like, Oh, polarization will allow us to do everything, but it certainly will. I don't know that we know all the things that it could allow us to do until we get it into a phone. Is this a polarizing topic? It could be, it could, okay. it absolutely, I mean, by definition it has to be. Yeah. Okay. By the way, Tom told me to say that guys. He did. I he never didn't. told you. <laughs> <laughs> now are polarized. <laughs> exactly. If Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard ends up closing, probably sometime in 2023, one of the things Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer wants to do is dig into the archives and bring back some classic games. Spencer told the Washington Post, I was looking at the IP list. I mean, let's go. King's Quest? Guitar Hero? Spencer said. We're hoping that we'll be able to work with them and when the deal closes to make sure we have resources to work on franchises that I love from my childhood and that the teams really want to get. Activision Blizzard also has Spyro the Dragon, Tony Hawk, and PlayStation's original mascot, Crash Bandicoot. 
We know several of you are crying. How about something original, Tune? We, we, we hear you. But Humorous, is there a forgotten IP that you would like to see Spencer throw resources at? Pitfall? Kaboom? Fishing Derby? <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of, of of a reboot of Fishing Derby. Uh, I think that was one of the original five. I think that Activision put out when they were still working out of the garage. Yeah. Uh, Pitfall is where my heart is. Yes. Loved Pitfall. Uh, Pitfall, Pitfall Harry Pitfall is Pitfall was, two. Pitfall, yeah, yeah, was a hero. It was a hero of mine. But I know they tried to reboot it. Like what? Ninety eight. Uh, I they, didn't play that one, but you're right. They did. And it they was did try not to good. It. Yeah, it yeah was they did a good. 3D one, but that was in the 80s. The 3D one was in eight. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, did a 3D one in the 80s too. So uh, uh, a yeah. respectful reboot of Pitfall could be great. Although part of me is like, no, just leave it alone. That one, that one, maybe you have to leave it alone. I don't know. Do do you have any of those those Activision Blizzard classics? So one I thought of, I, I was I was kind of thinking of uh, this one called Ultimate Air Combat. <laughs> that was I remember playing. It was on. It was uh, I think it was was it Atari? No, no, it was Nintendo. It was Nintendo, uh, I think the original one. It was, it was just a flight game, stupid. But, like, that, I remember that one. Also, Double Dragon, I believe they, they own the IP. They, yeah. yeah, that's their IP. I would love, to, I mean, that's as a fighting game, I would love to see that rebooted. Uh, they did Streets of Rage or some, Fist of Fury, something recently. Uh, mm -hmm. Not Activision necessarily, but, but like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see that one. Um, another one I looked up was uh, Ghostbusters. They seem to own the IP to that game, mm -hmm. uh, although it's, you know, from the movie. But right. we haven't had a Ghostbusters game, and there's in a, a while. new Ghostbusters movie. Although, yeah, yeah, I wonder what happened. To the game great, coming out but... with the movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, what Hexen. Hexen is another one that I see be people kicking around. Uh, although Microsoft kind of already owns some of Hexen's, like the distribution rights. So once they get Activision Blizzard, they would get all of Hexen, uh, <laughs> okay. which would make it easier. Nice. Uh, so. Yeah, I don't know, uh, folks. Uh, let us know. What do you think? Send us send us uh, your your Activision reboot that you would like to see, uh, if you would like one. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Oh, I was. I was sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm a big lover of Guitar Hero. That was like that I, before Rock Band. That was that was mine. So I I know those games died, uh, like like Toys to Life did a few years later. But I really want Guitar Hero back in some form. I mean, Guitar Hero seems perfect for VR, doesn't it? I didn't. Ooh, yes, because they already have a, a, a music game in there that I just played last week. I forgot what it was called. Uh, Beat Saber. So, yeah, Beat Saber is one of those. So, yeah, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, folks, uh, like I said, send us that email. Also, uh, big announcement. Uh, all next week, you're getting more in your feed if you're not already subscribing at one of the top levels on our Patreon. We are doing uh, what, what Justin Robert Young calls free HBO week. Back in the day, uh, sometimes if you didn't subscribe to HBO, they'd just give it to you for free for a week to see if they could lure you in. Uh, we are making all our exclusive Patreon content available to everyone. So if you're on the free public feed, you're going to get it. Uh, just keep an eye on our on our feeds. Uh, if you're at a lower tier on Patreon, you'll get the higher tier uh, episodes. If you like uh, what you hear, you can learn more at patreon.com slash DTNS. As we briefly mentioned yesterday, Netflix reported it added 8.28 million net subscribers in Q4 for a total of 221.8 million worldwide. That was not exactly good news. It missed its own forecast of 8.5 million and analyst expectations of 8.3 million. It's also about half the number of people it added during the same quarter in 2020. In a letter to shareholders, Netflix said streaming competition, quote, may be affecting our marginal growth sub. <laughs> you think? Uh, while that's certainly true to some extent, Netflix is also what some people are calling a pandemic trade company. That's a company that benefited particularly from people staying home more and saw accelerated growth as a result. We mentioned Peloton earlier in the show. Peloton's another example of what people sometimes call a pandemic trade company. But Netflix in particular has been, up until recently, cruising along pretty well. They were doing well before the pandemic, and that just boosted them. So what do you do now? if Netflix's growth is slowing and its own forecast for Q1 of this year isn't that great either. Well, two months ago, Netflix launched mobile games to get all of its members into titles like Stranger Things 3 The Game and Bowling Ballers. Uh, we just had the, the most recent uh, uh, additions to this. There was a, a card game and a puzzle game. 
In the wake of a bad earnings quarter, Netflix says it wants to expand its portfolio of games across both casual and core gaming genres. So all these casual games we've been seeing, that's not where they want to stay. In fact, some recent job listings point to live services games. Those are games that regularly get updated with new content. Think Fortnite, Apex Legends, Overwatch. Uh, they also have job listings that indicate they want to develop PC and console games. In fact, Netflix COO Greg Peters said the company was generally seeing good growth with the 10 mobile games it published and wants to explore Netflix's in-house IP more. And Netflix might look outside of itself, too. Peters added, quote, we are open to licensing large game IP that people will recognize. I think you will see some of that happen over the year to come. Squid Game Game. Okay, Squid Game Game is on. <laughs> like, that's obviously yeah. got to happen. A Lucifer game, maybe. Uh, I, I have thought that, and I have been wrong, <laughs> that, that Netflix <laughs> was, was just going to be like using games to extend their IP. And that was it. Then I right. then they started doing card games and stuff, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe they're just going to very slowly get into mobile and add games the way they did with streaming, and then a few years later, it'll build up to be big enough, and then they'll maybe split it off on its own if it's successful. Mm -hmm. But this kind of indicates that they want to be a little more accelerated than that, that they, they're out there. I mean, I don't know what they could license, what with Microsoft and Sony kind of dividing up the developer world, but but what indies are left? I guess EA. They could go to EA and say like, okay, let's let's license an EA game uh, into Netflix, uh, and and they are going to try to be one of those cloud based gaming competitors. It, it definitely seems like that's what they want to do. I, I think so. Yeah, the P the PC and console games are, are interesting. It's a crowded market for that. Uh, one thing uh, I want to go back to the mobile games I saw on uh, Yahoo Finance this morning when they were just talking about Netflix. Um, they mentioned that the Netflix app is on pretty much you know everybody's phone. You know yeah. you know, but that's not where people really watch it. They really watch Netflix on TV and laptop. Those are the two biggest ones. So there's an opportunity for Netflix here to 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 get their their name, get people back into using phones. And the mobile market is, is there. You can combine PC, VR, console, all the games, and you won't even come close to the mobile gaming market. So we may sit here and tease all oh, mobile gaming, but it is the biggest market out there. And even if they got a tiny share, we're talking about billions of dollars. And, and so that's why a lot of people wanted them to, hey, buy Take-Two, because they own Zynga. And you get Zynga games, and right. you, you're, yeah, you're all the then you have all kind of IPs. So uh, I, I I think they're gonna play around with mobile for a while. I don't I don't know what they're gonna do with the the with the, con, with the console and PC stuff, but I, I think you're right. Eventually, it all it's all gonna be cloud based anyway. And I, if you I, can I, access the game from your phone, and then it it Chromecast to your you know like sort of like Stadia to your uh, TV, that doesn't matter where where it starts from. And I don't know. Yeah, I it's a really good point about mobile. If I could absolutely see a Netflix meeting where they say, we have this huge mobile install base, and yet we're not making the best use of it. Uh, yes. we, we, we have this big of install base and this small utilization. What else can we do? And mobile gaming is an answer to that. Like, let's add mobile games and, and get people using us on mobile that will maybe make them use Netflix to watch video more often which increases our utilization and keeps sure. subscribers uh but it's also a new business we can build as we uh talked about all this week when in in relation to microsoft and activision uh the mobile gaming space is the biggest opportunity to generate revenue apple Absolutely. is the is the number three and likely to become number four uh biggest gaming company in the world because of mobile they, they don't do anything else so that's all they do yeah yeah so there's <laughs> There's a huge opportunity there for Netflix to get into mobile. And, and I wasn't trying to say they won't, but I kind of thought that's all they would do. And it looks like they're like, eh, I do no, too. we're not going to just sit on mobile. Well, yeah, we'll do mobile. Y'all are right. But but we're going we're gonna to get on the console. We're going to license some stuff. Yeah, maybe it's Take-Two stuff. In addition to mobile stuff, they could license from Take-Two. Maybe they'll license some other stuff. I wouldn't be shocked to see Netflix use Google Stadia's back end, which is what Google seems to want to do with it, to create a, a streaming it. service, I, I was I was going to mention uh, I was going to mention that somewhat like that. I, I didn't think that I forgot they do have a back end they're offering to companies for them. Yeah, like the white that. label. That's what they call it. The yeah. white label service. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you start it on your phone, but you end up with a controller or something, then you know does it really matter to to you know to Netflix because it's going to be in the cloud? That's fascinating. 
Yeah. Um, the the last thing the last tab they they can add if all else fails is they can make a, a Netflix talk. Just like a, just a TikTok that's in Netflix, of shorts, I mean, of red isn't notice. That's kind of what they have with those previews <laughs> on the mobile app. Those little circles, like I know that's yeah, more Snapchat true. than than TikTok. It, it's more, but but it's 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 in that direction though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> TikTok coming soon. All right, uh, Chris Christensen highlights the potential benefit of NFTs on your next outing. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another tech in travel minute. When we talk about NFTs, I'm not the biggest fan. And some of the things that I see that people are starting to use NFTs for in the travel space are fairly gratuitous. The NBA is going to have a series of NFTs commemorating their summer league. Okay. And then there's also a private dining club in New York City where you purchase your membership via an NFT. Okay. I think you're largely doing that just for the PR purpose. But one that was thought a little more intriguing is the National Football League is starting to partner with Ticketmaster to mint tickets of select NFL games as NFTs. So you went to the game and now you have proof that you were at that game where that amazing play happened. That's something I think was worth thinking about in terms of how you can use NFTs to actually add value to the experience. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. You know, that's a good point. Without paper tickets these days, usually that, that used to be, you know, when we were young, Lamar, that, that's how you'd know you went to a, a movie or a concert or or a sporting event was you had that ticket stub. And, and with mobile ticketing, you don't have that ticket stub anymore. That's, so That's really interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I still save like my uh, going to CES or E3 passes, though. So I, 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 I'm one of those old people that, that saved the physical. Yeah. So. And in the future, you'll they'll just give you an NFT of your CES badge. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I, but, but no, I mean, seriously, like people yeah, like no. to have that proof and mm -hmm. with, without paper tickets anymore, mm -hmm. I could see NFT, like just including it, right? It's like, hey, as, as part of your ticket, you get an NFT that says you went to the game and you got this online, you know, ticket stub collection. Uh, I like that idea. And, and then you can do things like add in highlights from the game and stuff, which is even cooler than, than just the ticket stub. So yeah, that's intriguing. That's fascinating. All right, let's check out the mailbag. I uh, got an email from Mike who said, well, I'm sure there will be some costs associated with customers having items they are interested in being shipped to the Amazon clothing store. That's the one opening in Glendale that we talked about yesterday. I bet it is a lot less than the cost they now have shipping and returning individual items to individual homes. Almost everything I purchased lately seems to have free returns. As a result, we frequently order items that we are far from certain that we will actually want to keep. Shoes are a great example. I bet my wife has had me return more than 20 pairs over the last couple of years. As an aside, we have a Kohl's very close to our house, and returning Amazon items there is an almost completely painless option. It would have to be cheaper for them to do that with deliveries they would be making as part of everyday business at a retail store. I thought the I thought the Kohl's deal was they, they Amazon canceled that. That's that's cool. Is that, that they over now? Them. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it might. I don't think they're going to renew it. But like, I always thought that was a really good idea. Go to a department store and and and, and do your returns. Well, returns with there, Amazon but... uh, wanting to make their own clothing stores, I imagine Kohl's might be like, yeah, okay, we're not going to partner. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we got another email from Josh. He says, first of all, those jaw excuse me, ooh, those jaw operated earphones really need to be bought by Jawbone. Yeah. But more importantly, for, for me, having limited movement in my arms for my disability, I have never been able to use tapping features on my AirPods Pro and rely on my phone to control playback. Uh, while possibly not the intended use case, this will be amazing for me and likely others with limited movement. Josh, you thank point. you so much for writing in. I yeah. I had the thought crossed my mind of like, I wonder if there's any accessibility appeal here. So it was great to get Josh's email uh, to confirm that, at least in his case, yes, uh, there is definitely an accessibility appeal. If you're if you're forgetting what we talked about, uh, it was these this technology being de developed that would have sensors in the earbuds that would detect your jaw movement. So instead of tapping to play or pause you'd just be able to like you know tap your teeth or or you know do something like to, to control playback yeah was that that wise ear right was that what it's called? wise ear that's right wise that ear. was the, okay yeah okay good, good yeah memory. i like that uh, special thanks to Jim Bailey, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Uh, Jim Bailey supports us in many different ways, not just monetarily. Thank you, Jim, uh, for all the years of support. Really appreciate it. And thank you, yeah. Lamar. Good to have you, man. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, uh, if you all like 
like uh, me, which you probably don't. I'm just kidding. Uh, wow, I love I'm, you, man. <laughs> what are you talking about? But uh, yeah, I'm Lamar. At, I'm at Lamar Wilson everywhere. I do short form content. Uh, basically, been known as the CEO of unboxings. That, that was a playful name that TikTok gave me, and I'm keeping it. <laughs> nice, nice. Congratulations yes. on, on your uh, your promotion. promotion. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate Thank that. You. Uh, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Rich Strafalino. See you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer and writer and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shit, I saw you modding just today. Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Lamar Wilson. And our guest this week was Jonathan Strickland. Thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>